I'm very, very pleased to welcome uh, Dr. Mary Davis here for this masterclass, which is called Raising Awareness of Current Issues, Improving Inclusion in Academic Integrity. And this is a masterclass under a, a project that's funded under the Sattle 2022 funding by the National Forum and the HEA. And it's under a project called Reimagining Assessment and Feedback for Student Success. So I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Mary Davis. She's Academic Integrity Lead and Principal Lecturer for Education and Student Experience in the Business School in Oxford Brookes University in the United Kingdom. She has uh, researched plagiarism and academic integrity since 2005 and written widely on the topic. And she has a particular interest in improving inclusive practice in academic integrity and is a member of the board of directors of the International Centre for Academic Integrity. So I'm very pleased to welcome Mary today and I'm looking forward myself uh, to this master class. So thank you very much, Mary, and I'll hand it over to you. Maybe to say to people to keep their microphones muted and um, there will be opportunities for discussion and either raise your hand or you're very welcome at any stage to, to use the chat box. Thank you everybody. Thanks Deirdre and morning everyone and thank you for your perseverance to join today. I know it has been a bit challenging so um, I'm just going to start by sharing my slides. Is that OK? Can you see them? Yes, that's great, Mary. Great, thank you. OK, so um, as Deirdre said, um, my aim today, I'm going to try and raise your awareness of current issues as well as discuss improving inclusion in academic integrity. We've got quite a packed uh, session ahead. I hope you've got lots of energy. Um, we're going to try and get through these six areas, at least um, to some extent today. Uh, we're going to be talking about embedding uh, UDL, Universal Design for Learning Guidelines, in institutional academic integrity policies. We're going to talk about an educational route for um, academic conduct procedures. We're going to talk about Universal Design for Learning also in terms of uh, teaching academic integrity and at that point I'm going to also run a workshop with you so that will be uh, something for you to engage in um, to try to understand and improve inclusion for students and uh, then we're also going to discuss uh, creating a culture of academic integrity for everyone and how to do that challenging task um, also, we'll talk about raising awareness of custom writing services. And finally, it has to be at the end, otherwise we'd probably talk about it for the whole session. We're going to talk a bit about artificial intelligence tools, the ubiquitous chat GPT and approaches to that. I hope that all sounds interesting, although, yeah, it's going to be challenging to get through. So at times I might be talking a bit fast, but we are recording, so I hope that's OK. Please do engage in the chat. This is your session. I really want you to um, ask questions, comment, um, uh, discuss things together so that you get the most out of it. OK, so. Uh, we're going to start by looking at Universal Design for Learning Guidelines in Institutional Academic Integrity Policies. I've heard from Deirdre that this is an area that you've been focusing on uh, incorporating uh, Universal Design for Learning principles, and I'm a big fan, so I'm on the same page as you with that. Um, so let's just look at why we need to do it. Um, I've been researching overrepresentation of certain student groups. So particular student groups have been found to have far more academic conduct uh, investigations and referrals. So referring meaning uh, where they are um, uh, going to be possibly uh, investigated for an academic conduct problem. So in um, uh, Oxford Brookes uh, data, uh, what we found is while uh, 
international students make up 15% of the student body. They're actually 28% of the referrals for academic conduct problems, so almost double. And then Asian and Black uh, students have been especially overrepresented in academic conduct uh, issues. Uh, the, uh, other research has um, looked at uh, some possible issues for non-native speaker uh, students. They may not um, understand Turnitin results appropriately if they're not given sufficient support. And also um, academic literacy instruction may be quite patchy. Uh, it may be that you know, some students have access to it, but others don't. So I conducted some um, EDI research. I was looking at trying to improve policies, procedures, teaching and support. And I looked at the documents that we use. Um, I interviewed a key staff in academic integrity roles. And crucially, I interviewed students who'd been through an academic conduct investigation. And this was my paper in the International Journal for Educational Integrity. Um, I'm going to just draw on some of um, my evidence here from different student groups in the um, data for this paper. So um, this one is uh, about international students. So from an international student, they point out that um, they, they feel sort of stuck that um, they should know about something, but they don't know and they don't know what to do about it. So really highlighting the need for um, clear signposting and support and an assumption by a member of teaching staff that there are particular nationalities um, that have more difficulty. In terms of disability, and I believe you have um, uh, this this may be something that you're also addressing. Um, these are some comments about uh, students uh, with dyslexia in particular, um, where there's an association with having difficulty with academic conduct and um, having dyslexia. Um, so this is a student participant who uh, talks about the stress of having an investigation. Um, as a dyslexic student. Um, um, the librarian in my research pointed out that uh, students who are dyslexic can be very scared to come into the library and the academic conduct investigator points out how, how stressful it is for these groups of students to have investigations. Now in terms of widening participation by which I mean um, students who come from uh, underrepresented groups in terms of the student body um, and maybe first in family to attend university or from a low socioeconomic background. Um, so other researchers pointed out that they, this group of students may not be prepared for university and may have unintentional academic conduct breaches. Um, the student participant in my research points out how overwhelming it can be to try and take in um, understanding of academic integrity. And a member of staff pointed out about this, this kind of downward spiral that some students may experience if they feel they don't belong, they don't ask for help, they have more problems. When they have problems, they don't ask for help. So um, really highlighting the need to do more for uh, these student groups. Um, overall, I would say there are issues with problems for support in academic integrity. Sessions at the beginning of a student's uh, course of study may not be enough, may not be uh, individualised. Um, there are issues of face for some students feeling they should already know or they don't have time to practise before they're assessed. Um, documents may be very long and unengaging and um, some earlier research I did uh, really demonstrated that we need to provide students with continuous support in order for them to learn about academic integrity. Um, also, we need to think about the requirement for inclusion 
in higher education. So the UK Equalities Act, I'm sure there's something similar in Ireland, requires universities by law to ensure learning, teaching and assessment uh, practices are inclusive, have equal opportunities. And um, I always use this uh, quote from Liz Thomas and Helen May, that's an advanced HE study, where they defined inclusion as a way of making higher education accessible, relevant and engaging to all students. And I believe those three words are really, really useful um, because by making academic integrity accessible, we ensure that all students can engage and understand it. By making it relevant, we make sure that it is prioritised um, for those students. Um, and by making it engaging, we ensure that uh, students don't ignore it um, and uh, take part in it um, as uh, an element of their study. And for all students, I think when we improve inclusion for specific student groups, we improve it for all students. So uh, back to my analysis, these are the documents that I looked at. We um, have a letter that requests students attend an, an investigative interview. We have a document that sets out our academic conduct breaches. Um, we have an academic conduct procedure and academic integrity advice documents. So these are the four key documents in academic integrity that we use in my institution. And I looked at universal design for learning and selected the what of learning representation. And uh, going into that, I looked just at comprehension because I felt this was the baseline, the, the most important kind of um, foundation for them to uh, be able to follow academic integrity. So I, I looked at the um, checkpoints for comprehension, which are activate or supply background knowledge, highlight patterns, critical features, big ideas and relationships, guide information processing and visualization and maximize transfer and generalization. So these are the four checkpoints under comprehension. And I would say of those, um, I also concluded that guiding information processing was the most important. So I'm just going to show you an example of what I did. So um, these are the features that I've just talked about, or checkpoints, I should call them, the checkpoints of comprehension, these four. And then uh, here, this is the, um, one of the examples of the four documents that I looked at. So the definitions of cheating policy, which was then changed to the academic conduct breaches. Now, what I did, I tried to map the universal design for learning um, uh, principles to this policy and I looked at whether this policy was doing these four check following these uh, four checkpoints and so these are my comments on uh, what they were doing or areas of concern and then these are my suggested recommendations following UDL. So in terms of activating or supplying background knowledge um, I noted that the policy contained an introduction um, which immediately went into a warning of being expelled or losing a degree. And then it contained one link to the procedure document. So um, my recommendation based on that was that, that we should have links to all the documents together. They should link up. Um, and also we should be linking to information students should already be familiar with, such as guidance from the library. So thereby activating and supplying background knowledge. And we should also focus on good practice, not immediately go into warnings about being expelled. I don't think that's helpful for student um, understanding of what they're supposed to do. Uh, that could come in somewhere else, but not at the beginning. Then um, in terms of highlighting patterns, um, so uh, what I noticed is they used a bold text for breaches. 
um, and they stated that the library has a leaflet, but there was no link to the library. And I noticed that it mentioned a procedure, but didn't have a link. So again, an absence of links that would help students to follow up things. So and my recommendation was to provide links to the library information and links to the process and procedure for support, because support is absolutely crucial when setting out the policy. Uh, I already said that I felt guiding information processing was the most important. So what I noticed in this policy was the titles in a big black box. I'm not sure academic integrity always needs to have a big black box. It's not very friendly. Um, and then the breaches, bizarrely, were listed with Roman numerals. I got lots of feedback from students, actually, that they didn't like these or uh, weren't familiar with them, sometimes wondering what three eyes was supposed to mean, for example. Um, and I also noticed that they included some legal terms such as fraud. Um, and then I also noticed uh, some repetition within the breaches. So my suggestions were remove the black box. I don't think we need to make academic integrity so unfriendly. Um, and uh, remove the uh, the Roman numerals, put standard uh, numbers. I don't think there's any need for Roman numerals. And uh, alongside that, remove the legal terms. Again, there shouldn't be legal terms in uh, setting out student academic conduct breaches and also remove repetition and use consistent terms. So numbering, um, making sure the terms are consistent and use of bold text. And then in terms of maximising transfer and generalisation, what I noticed is that the policy contained a link to the UK Academic Integrity Charter that was um, written by the QAA, uh, but this charter is not linked in other documents. So uh, again, I thought add consistent links to all documents that would be really helpful, uh, provide teaching resources and examples for students to apply their understanding so they can generalise from this information. So as I said, this is just a brief um, mention of uh, the work I did to try to uh, map universal design for learning principles to the policy. And given that this is a focus in your institutions, perhaps you can also input policy and look at how to apply universal design for learning principles um, to policies to help students with understanding. Um, you know, comprehension is the basic thing that we need students to be able to do with those documents. OK, so um, I wonder if anyone would like to comment, add uh, something in the chat. This uh, icon is going to indicate a moment for reflection. So. Um, what do you think from your knowledge of your policies? What would uh, what aspects of your policy would benefit from applying universal design for learning principles? Consistency, are your documents entirely consistent? Do you help students to navigate through the documents? Uh, what about links? That was a big issue that I noticed. Um, what about avoiding legal language or considering prior learning involving students in the document. That's not something I mentioned before, but I'm aware of some very good practice where uh, students are invited to give feedback and also to that uh, they are actually incorporated in the document. Um, so the, the uh, student roles in academic integrity are highlighted in the policy. Um, I don't know if anyone has uh, comments would like to say anything or add comments in the chat in terms of this. I'll just wait a moment in case anyone wants to unmute or comment. Um, yes, go ahead. Uh, sorry, I'm not quite sure how to say your name. Is it Neve? Yeah. Hi, okay, everybody. Neve. Um, Neve here um, from the Mayo campus. I was actually trying to type the message and I reckon I'd be quicker speaking than trying to yes, type I it. Think sometimes Mary, thanks. Would. So thank you so much for everything that you've shared so much. There's lots of uh, food for thought. When you mentioned Turnitin training, I thought that maybe um, that would be useful 
to maybe have something standard and consistent linked in to the academic integrity policy. I guess I personally would be au fait with what was the GMIT academic integrity policy. I'm guessing that we have or will have an updated and standard uh, ATU academic integrity policy. Somebody can update me on that. But I thought maybe if we had a couple of animated um, shared videos on the turn it in, because, for example, as a lecturer, I probably could benefit with a little training on turn it in myself, and I'm sure the students could. That's my Great. Good thought. Thanks. Um, I will uh, perhaps in the break um, find my link to uh, a turn it in video that I've made, which is focused on uh, trying to help staff and students interpret um, uh, turn it in. So if that would be useful to you, um, I will also share that. Yes, please. Great. OK, um, Orla, you also have a comment. You want to come in, Orla? Please yeah. unmute. Hi, Mary, Hi, thanks for that. Um, Mary, I think I um, had a, the benefit of a, of a talk by you some years ago. And oh, really? one of the things I, I think perhaps the name was very familiar to me, put it that way, when I saw the when I saw this. But I um, one of the things that I did do after doing some, my UDL training, um, you see the comment you have there about um, helping students to consider prior learning. Um, and that was one of the things that I was kind of quickly and easily able to do in my module, because I do anatomy and physiology, even though they're first years, they most of them have done like biology in secondary school. And so what I do now at the start of every new topic is kind of get them into their little twos or threes, however they're sitting in the lecture room um, and get them to bullet point everything and anything that they might know about the topic before we start. And then I um, go around all the little groups and I put everything up on the whiteboard. Um, and I said, it doesn't matter how simple you think it is or how much you know or how, how little you know, to try and give them confidence that before I even start the topic, that actually collectively in the room, they know a lot. And I can't say that it, um, I can see benefit from, you know, from how they perform afterwards. I don't know, but I, I suppose I do is to help them, hopefully to help them feel better about what they what they do know. And sometimes they just have to pull into the recesses of their mind to pull some stuff out um, and yet reassure them that if you don't know any of this, if you haven't done any of this before, um, then that's fine because I'm going to do it all with you. But anything yeah. you know already, um, it, don't underestimate what you know already because it'll come out hopefully when you need it. That's a wonderful example. Thank you, Orla. Um, yeah, I, I really agree. It's so beneficial to get students to, to talk about their prior learning and give them more confidence, um, you know, to to get started um, with further learning. But it's drawing on what they already know and building on that. Uh, I think that's very, very helpful. OK, I'm going to move on. Um, so we're now going to look at an educational route. Um, I don't know how much. Uh, so I can see uh, Deirdre's comments about um, bringing in a new academic integrity policy. I don't know if you have um, an educational route. But I'm just going to talk about the one um, that I was able to bring in at Oxford Brooks. So um, why do it? Um, one of the uh, key influences on me uh, some time ago is Betty Leask in Australia. So if you look at this quote, I feel it's so insightful, basically saying that, um, you know, uh, we can't assume that punishments deter. Sometimes in academic integrity, the focus is so much on punishment. You know, if you do this, this will be the consequence and you will lose marks. You may be uh, expelled from university, etc. But um, what she points out is that if the concept isn't understood and if students don't know what to do or can't do what they have to do to avoid it, no deterrent is effective. I felt this so insightful. Um, you know, basically, we've always got to teach what we need our students to do. Um, and academic integrity is not a simple thing. Many students really struggle with how they're supposed to engage with sources, how they're supposed to approach their assignments. So we need to actively teach it and support students. 
we can't rely on punitive policies. And also um, this quote from uh, Mott Smith and colleagues, non-deceitful behaviour, which actually comprises the majority of academic conduct cases, um, you know, it's typically from students not knowing that something is problematic or just lacking the ability to avoid it. We should have a pedagogical response to that, not a punitive one. So this is what I fight for as well. And uh, what I was able to bring in, now I hope this is big enough on your screen, apologies if it isn't, um, I will share the slides afterwards. Um, we have uh, our academic conduct procedure when there's a suspected um, uh, breach, uh, students are referred to our central team uh, for a possible investigation. However, if that team decide um, this is a minor breach, so it's not the student has copied everything or colluded extensively or used a custom writing service. If it is something like um, they haven't paraphrased enough, they haven't used enough citation, they haven't sort of fully engaged with academic conventions, um, no worries, Mary, um, then uh, we are not, and they are in their first year of study. Now, first year of study could be uh, first year at undergraduate, or they may be joining in the second or third year, or they may be joining the institution in um, a, a master's degree. Whatever the first year of study at Oxford Brooks, if they have a minor breach, then they do not go through an investigation or have any penalty. They go through an educational route. So we brought in this educational route that has two compulsory steps. The first is some online training that the student must complete. It's a one hour um, course in academic integrity and then a follow up um, a live session could be online or on campus with our academic development team. So in a small group of uh, between two and eight uh, students, they um, have uh, some further training, discussion, reflection on academic integrity. Um, and then there's some additional optional enrichment that students can take. They can take further sessions with the academic development team or library team. So that's what we brought in and we're assessing the, the impact. It certainly reduced the number of cases. Many of those students including those overrepresented ones that I mentioned at the beginning, the, the groups who are um, international uh, Asian black students, particularly who have been overrepresented. Many of those have uh, first minor breaches in their first year of study, so they are no longer penalised or having to go through a stressful investigation, which I believe is uh, a disproportionate uh, response to what they've done. So we're giving uh, a new opportunity for um, learning and um, engaging with academic integrity through this educational route. So um, maybe I should just also stop for a second um, and um, ask you whether an educational route is is possible in your institution. Is that some it, institutions, I know you're from a variety. Um, would you be able to bring in an educational route for um, students who have an academic conduct problem? It's kind of a yes, no, I suppose. Would anyone like to comment on that? Maybe I can ask Deirdre, is it? Oh, I know someone's come through. Sorry, uh, Jacqueline? Yeah, I, I think the answer is yes. OK, great. Just navigating our way through that. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank yeah. you very much, Jacqueline. OK, so uh, in connection with that, we're now going to look at embedding universal design for learning principles in academic integrity teaching. So I have been leading 
uh, what's called a collaborative enhancement project, um, which is funded by the QAA, the Quality Assurance Agency in the UK, uh, across uh, four institutions. So my institution, Oxford Brookes, uh, University of Westminster, University of Southampton and Bloomsbury Institute London. So what we've done is bring together academic integrity experts with inclusion experts and then student union officers and students. That's our project team, quite a lot of people involved. The crucial thing, I think, particularly is bringing together the expertise in academic integrity with inclusion. So people like heads of inclusion, people who have a, a specific uh, role in inclusion in uh, universities. And then we studied the universal design for learning principles and thought about how to apply them. And then we um, have uh, been working on teaching resources through a sort of procedure of proposing them to the team and then discussing them, drafting them, discussing again, revising and developing. So over quite a period of time, gradually developing teaching resources and in particular getting feedback from the inclusion experts on um, whether it's meeting our inclusion goals and rechecking our resources against the universal design for learning principles. So that's how we've worked on it. And we've also incorporated some other uh, accessibility tools such as uh, Blackboard Alley. Um, and this is an example of, um, well, this is actually our infographic of uh, the uh, resources we've developed for use with students. I'll, I'll share a link. The, these are directly uh, shareable and available to um, everyone. Uh, they're an open access resource on the QAA uh, website. So uh, maybe you can see we've uh, focused quite a bit on games to try and make academic integrity engaging, coming back to that accessible, relevant and engaging um, definition. Well, thank you, Neve. Um, and uh, we've uh, in addition to games, we've also got quite a number of discussion type activities. So all of these are designed to make academic integrity interesting, to get students to do things with academic integrity um, and to really um, yeah, maybe to some extent at least have fun with it. And then we've also developed resources for use with staff. Um, so to try to uh, enhance staff training um, to uh, be more um, accessible and inclusive in their approaches to teaching academic integrity. So we have a template, which I'll show you in a minute, um, to uh, for any staff who are developing new resources to check um, if they are inclusive and accessible. Um, we have a discussion activity and a couple of, um, well, this is a workshop we're going to have a look at in a moment, a workshop on awareness raising and also a presentation on using Turnitin inclusively. So Turnitin is another big area of my work. So um, I brought that in. Um, so this is our template for staff. Um, we've called it Partners, which stands for, and I'm so glad this was already uh, highlighted, um, uh, prior experiences, the importance of bringing in prior experiences. I think that was uh, Neve who mentioned that. And then um, accessibility, reinforcement, timing, navigation, engagement, revision of tasks and specificity to disciplines. So these are the areas for our checklist. And then under each heading, we have questions to try and um, get any member of staff who's developing academic integrity resources to think, OK, am I incorporating um, prior learning into this resource? And then am I thinking about all areas of accessibility? So um, if things like am I providing alternative formats or a glossary or um, have I avoided examples that specific to one uh, linguistic or cultural group. So a set of questions that we've developed under each of the, the partner um, headings. So before we go on to the next area, 
I am going to um, get us going on a different um, presentation. Bear with me a moment where I just, I'm hoping I can just swing this across. Can you see a new presentation? Yes, Mary, yes. Great, lovely, thank you. So what we're going to do next, so get ready, everyone. You may um, want a pen for the <laughs> or some uh, means of recording in a moment. Um, we're going to start an activity, uh, which is one of the resources that um, I developed as part of this collaborative enhancement uh, project. And um, the uh, aim of it is to get you thinking more about inclusion um, and uh, this does incorporate the universal design for learning principles in um, academic integrity. So it's a staff workshop on awareness raising of inclusion. Um, just to let you know, in our project, the way we defined inclusion is inclusion involves celebrating differences in all aspects of who we are as individuals with every person respected, valued and supported. We aim to integrate it within our practice to enhance engagement, participation, learning and choice for all. And that's a sort of background guiding thought as you do uh, this activity. So what are you going to do? You're going to put yourself in the position of a student. And that student's going to be in their first year of study at your institution. That doesn't mean they're necessarily undergraduate, as I said, they could be um, foundation, they could be um, postgraduate, but they're in their first year of study at your institution. So already start thinking about being that student. And then what you're going to do is choose the perspective of one of the students, I'm going to show you some profiles in a moment, or you can create your own example perspective. The important thing is to try to consider how that perspective may be different to your own. OK, so don't choose someone who seems like you. Right. This is the key thing. You're going to try and put yourself in someone else's shoes to view academic integrity differently. OK, so here are three student profiles. I'll just go through them um, so you can choose any one of these profiles or create another student profile yourself. So one option, you could be Sam. You'll notice all of these um, are uh, non gender specific um, profiles. So Sam is um, a UK undergraduate student in your context, an Irish undergraduate student who has dyslexia and has alternative entry qualifications. Sam is first in family to attend university, comes from an area with low participation rates in higher education. OK, so that's one profile you could choose or you could be Ezra. Ezra is an international master's student who speaks English as a second language, has 10 years of work experience after graduating from a non-UK or non-Irish university and is coming to Ireland for the first time. Ezra has no prior experience of studying or working in English. OK, so that's Ezra or you could be Joe. Joe is a mature part-time undergraduate student and a carer who has a full-time job and no recent educational experience. Joe has ADHD and has disclosed difficulties with concentration and working memory. All right, so the options are, please choose one of those profiles, Sam, Ezra or Joe, or another student. You can choose another student, but Crucially, make sure it's someone who is different to you, has different identity markers um, uh, and uh, maybe different abilities to you. OK, so um, I hope now everyone's had an, uh, a moment to think about, OK, I'm going to be Sam, Ezra, Joe, someone else. All right. 
So think about that perspective and then I'm going to explain the task. What you're going to do is I'm going to give you a set of statements. They all relate to academic integrity. And um, what you're going to do with those statements is rate them with a score of 10. I agree with that statement from my student perspective. Five, I partially agree with that statement. Or zero, I disagree with that statement. Um, so please don't use any numbers between. Uh, please use either 10, 5 or 0. OK, I hope that makes sense. Does anyone have any questions before we start the activity? Mary, could I ask you to go back to the previous slide for one second so I can just reread the profile? Yes, sure. OK, so here's the previous slide. Uh, please take on one of these roles or create another student profile. Just make sure it's different to your own. Is that OK? I'm not sure if it was Orla or, or Jacqueline who was asking me there, but um, I hope that's OK. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Great. All right. I'll remind you of the scores uh, with each question. So you haven't got to remember what 10 means. Um, I'll remind you of those with each question. So you're going to rate these statements according to academic integrity with the perspective of this student. OK, let's get started. So here's the first question. So imagine you are that student. How would they respond to this statement? I know how to get academic support from the university if I need it. So would you, from your perspective, say, yes, I agree. In which case, please note down 10 points. Or would it be five partially agree, in which case, um, yeah, five points or zero for disagree? OK. So hopefully you've had time to think about and answer that question from your student perspective. Let's move on to question two. Question two, I can easily understand the academic conduct regulations. Think about your student perspective. Do you agree, partially agree or disagree? So note down your score. At the end, we're going to calculate the scores. So please note down whether you agree, 10 points, 5, partially agree or 0, disagree. OK, question 3. I am used to academic conventions, in other words, citation and reference lists. So think about your student perspective. Would you say you agree? in which case 10 points or partially agree, five points or zero, disagree. OK, I'll go on. Question four, I am confident in using the library. So think about that student perspective. How do you feel about that point? If you agree, 10 points. If you partially agree, five points. If you disagree, zero. OK, let's go on to question five. I have no difficulty in constructing academic texts like essays. So please rate this statement from your student perspective. Is it 10, you agree, 5, partially agree, 0, disagree? OK, go on to question 6. Or statement 6, I should be calling these. I can ask questions to my tutor about academic integrity. From your student perspective, would you say you agree, 
10 points. Partially agree, five points. Disagree, zero. Question seven. I can make good decisions based on my interpretation of Turnitin or other text matching software results. What would a student in your, uh, your choice of perspective um, respond to this? So 10 agree, five partially agree, zero disagree. Question eight, I can express my voice in my writing with ease. What would a student from the perspective that you've chosen respond to this? So 10 agree, five partially agree, zero disagree. Question nine, I find it easy to paraphrase and summarize ideas from my reading. How would a student respond from the perspective you've chosen? Would they agree 10 points, partially agree five points, disagree zero? And finally, question 10, I am able to organize myself efficiently to do my own work. How would a student respond from your chosen perspective? 10 for agree, five partially agree, and zero for disagree. Okay, so that's the last question. What you're going to do now is calculate your score. Hope that's not uh, too challenging. Add up, you should have a total between zero and 100. And what you need to do is think about the answers that led to this score. So what does that score demonstrate about academic integrity for someone with the perspective you chose for this exercise? I'm really interested in what you felt um, and any responses to that question. Would anybody like to share either in the chat or please unmute? Maybe you're still adding up. Would anybody like to comment on what they think it shows uh, for a student from the perspective that you chose? OK, thank you very much, Margaret. Um, do you want to say any more? Would you like to unmute? Yeah, um, it, it just doing that exercise just really, really made me aware of, I suppose, perspectives that I wouldn't have even thought of, you know, and, um, you know, putting yourself into someone else's shoes like that yeah. who have, has a different background to yourself, you know, as I said, things that I would actually not have thought about uh, would definitely raise issues and concerns for someone coming from that particular type of background. So it's a really good exercise to demonstrate that and, you know, to highlight the challenges first year's experience. Great. I'm so glad you felt that, uh, Margaret. I think um, one of the things is we, we always look at things from our own perspective. <laughs> it's obvious, you know, but um, in order to really practice uh, inclusion, uh, be more inclusive in uh, academic integrity, I think we really need to try and view things from a student perspective. Yeah. OK. 
Um, so your your total score, Margaret, was five, was it? Or was it you responded yes. five to, to it each was, question? No, no. Most questions were zero and I had a total right, right. score of five. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Um, so, Neve, I see you also had um, a score of five. Did, did you want to say any more? Um, I picked Joe and okay. I think it really made me think about so much. Um, and I actually think I've, I'd like to think that I would have more empathy now for my students. <laughs> and the reason I picked Joe is um, I deliver a fair few modules to part time students, part time mature learners. Um, so I got I hope I'll be more compassionate moving forward. That's great. Well, that's a fantastic outcome. I'm really glad you felt that. Um, thank you, Neve. And Orla, you said a student induction. Did you want to talk about that? Only just to say some of the things that came up, I was thinking in terms of what I could write as a score. I was thinking, well, I wonder, did they go to students? Did they go to the induction? And so in terms of how to use the library or to get a library induction, like, so I'm I'm kind of guessing, you know, there's a lot of unknowns, I suppose, just when you're answering a statement. Um, yeah. Like that. I was thinking student induction crucial and I know they don't remember everything that they hear at induction in fact they probably remember very little but even if they remembered that oh we were told something about this or we were shown um this that they know where to go to for it you know so that it's not a complete oh I have no idea what you're talking about I've never heard of academic integrity that you know that so the things that they would cover in student induction I think um even if they don't remember everything, but if they have the resource to go back to it, like the yeah. um, kind of the Moodle page or the kind of academic success um, things that we have, you know that there's a place yes. to go for it. So I think that's that's a really good point. And quite often, um, certain student groups may miss induction or. Uh, may not realise the importance of sessions about academic integrity. Um, it may not be a, a, a priority. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we need to follow up, I think. I think um, I would say induction is really important, but we need more sessions after induction as well. Um, but uh, I'm glad it's got you thinking about that, uh, Orla. Um, so I'm just looking at, at uh, Laura's comment now. Laura, do you want to expand? You, you're talking about um, the need to make things easier for students with communication and signposting. Yeah, uh, thanks, Mary. Uh, great session and really makes you think about academic integrity, um, even from, from my point of view as a lecturer. Um, and perhaps <clears throat> even when I started I, maybe I didn't get enough training in this space as well and that's maybe something to hold my hand up to um, and just to <laughs> share out loud with all my colleagues but anyway you learn um, but yeah like signposting and making that communication very simple and perhaps yeah. you know make it very visible in a space and perhaps you know it, it is and maybe that's my on my behalf I'm not aware of it fully but even if they have some output to demonstrate what they've learned from from a workshop or something hands on to make them aware of it themselves, because maybe students, you know, they see it, they know it's it's kind of a um, a space that they should be aware of. But really, how do we test their knowledge? So yes. maybe so, so that's kind of really where, you know, I'm really reflecting on. It's a great exercise, actually. So um, thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Laura. Um, well, thank you everyone for your comments. I'm, I'm really glad if it's got you thinking um, and made you think about perhaps some possible changes to how you do things or how you engage students. So um, great. Thank you all very much. So um, we're about halfway through this masterclass now. And uh, I was encouraged by uh, Deirdre to take uh, a break in the session. So I'm going to suggest now that we take a five minute break, a um, bit of uh, leg stretching, cup of tea perhaps, um, and I'll see you again in five minutes. Thank you, Mary.
OK, I think we're ready to get going again. I have just put um, a couple of links in the chat um, that you're welcome to have a look at um, after the session. So there's a video I've made about interpreting Turnitin and also a guide to the QAA resources. So what we're going to look at next is uh, creating a culture of academic integrity for everyone. I think you can still see my screen. So. OK, um, creating a culture of academic integrity, um, I think it's been acknowledged in many uh, studies that it's really important as a way of educating all members of the community about academic integrity. We can't also assume that staff know everything about academic integrity. I think everyone needs some training, support and uh, means of uh, engaging as a community. So that's in the um, guidelines, the fundamental values from uh, the International Centre for Academic uh, Integrity. Um, I believe it's really important to raise staff awareness, um, encourage staff to take uh, a responsibility and act as a role model to students, but also to involve students as stakeholders in champion, ambassador or partner roles and to, for them to spread messages. So this is also in line with the QAA Academic Integrity Charter that uh, we are signed up to. Principle one is everyone is responsible as part of a whole community approach. And also we aim to engage and empower students. So um, the principle states that higher education providers can support their students by ensuring that they have a reasonable and continuing opportunity to learn about their policies and processes in an accessible manner and through a variety of formats. So that is what I believe we should aspire to, making sure that students have opportunities to learn and opportunities to engage in academic integrity. Um, here are a few suggestions for deterring cheating. So um, building an academic integrity culture in the classroom, finding ways for students to engage and to monitor and check them, I think is a really good and important starting point. Um, and then reviewing the design of assessments, keeping them original, keeping them personalised, giving vivas is an additional step. Trying to connect assessment with working class is really useful um, and also explaining the link for students between assessment and success, uh, sorry, engagement and success in assignments. Educating students about avoiding contract cheating, for example, is another step that I think is very useful and publicising the university policy and penalties. So there's lots of things we can do, not necessarily big things, but sometimes something that can be just built into a class with a reminder, a brief session, maybe a short activity. Um, there are lots of things that can be done to keep our students following good academic practice. Now, one thing that is also part of the project and is in that um, QAA link is this champion model that we developed as part of the collaborative enhancement project. So uh, we decided that um, we wanted to create something that could be um, the stages of development for um, involving students in a key role in academic integrity. So what this CHAMPION acronym stands for is the, the stages of development in order for other institutions to do this. So um, in order to start a student academic integrity CHAMPION um, kind of uh, role process, first of all, any institution needs to collect some information. What is currently um, being done about academic integrity and what student roles are there that this role could fit into. 
and then hone the definition. So what exactly would a student academic integrity champion do? What would be their exact role? And then uh, having done that, sort of do doing the groundwork, the next stage is attracting, recruiting and selecting a, a student or a group of students uh, for this role. So thinking about how to promote uh, such a role to students and then thinking about what you require to uh, recruit and select. Would a student need to provide an expression of interest or would you interview them or would you um, uh, take on every student who uh, applies? And then uh, managing and preparing the role. So making sure there's someone that uh, a student uh, that would have responsibility for uh, the student um, who would be able to support them in the role and uh, preparing that role for them. Then I believe it's very important to bring in a stage of piloting, so trying out the role uh, with students, maybe with a small project, first of all, and then involving them in academic integrity so they have uh, some meaningful contribution to make. Um, then to observe and reflect on what they're doing and also finally to nurture the role to make sure that this can be an ongoing role. So I'm not sure about your institutions, but there's a big push, at least in the UK, to have students as partners. This is um, really uh, being encouraged. So we're having this student partner role in lots of areas in um, supporting curriculum, supporting different educational projects in, um, for example, in inclusion. Um, and uh, academic integrity, having a student partner in academic integrity may be another way that this uh, role could come in. Um, we decided to keep the students as champions, so their key role is actually to promote academic integrity, not to sit on academic conduct committees or uh, having that sort of role, um, but to promote it. So uh, let's think uh, for a moment and invite you to reflect on how could you involve students in academic integrity and how could you encourage students and staff to take responsibility for academic integrity? So I'd like you to think about those um, thoughts. Would you be able to bring in a student academic integrity champion role, for example? Uh, I'd love to see any comments or if you would like to say something, please unmute yourself. Yes, Neve. Uh, hi. In what was GMIT, the Teaching and Learning Office had and still has um, PAL or PASS, where the second years mentor the first years. Now, there's probably somebody on the call who can clarify this. Um, the, those mentors probably already have quite a lot to do. Maybe that existing rule could be modified that might be creating additional work. It's just a thought and it's not really an area I'm familiar with. OK, thank you, Neve. I don't know if anyone else does want to comment on that. Um, sometimes it is very useful to try and fit the this role in academic integrity in with other existing student roles. Um, or uh, to to create a new role. Yes, Jacqueline. I think I'm, I'm not involved in this myself, Mary and colleagues, but I think the End Tutor Project has announced and um, academic uh, student champions. And one of the areas that we'll be looking at is around academic integrity, EDI, EDL, etc. So, Perfect. Yeah. That sounds an ideal opportunity then to to bring this in. I think um, what uh, what I've found um, trying to bring in the role, one of the key considerations is, are you going to pay the students? Is it work or is it volunteering? 
and you know different institutions can do different things we've been funded by QAA so we've been able to pay students for their contributions to date but we're still working out can we pay students I don't know about your institutions but we find some things students can be paid for and others not it depends how you define it and depends on um, all budgeting uh, yes go on Jacqueline this up now because I said that comment. I'm not sure if it's the students or staff who are the academic champions. Maybe the ah. in the corner for that. But I look it up because I think they're trying to involve the students as well. Okay. And would they pay the students, Jacqueline? No idea. I say I'm kind of peripherally um involved in this and other stuff. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Eileen thinks it's both, so both staff and students. Okay, great. Um Someone else, I think, is there another hand up? No. OK. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I do think uh, involving students directly in promoting academic integrity, uh, it really is a win win. It is so good to involve students because you get their perspective, different way of communicating, um, peer to peer uh, communication is so different to staff to student and and everyone benefits so uh, i would really encourage that okay um now the next thing we're going to look at is quite different we're going to look at custom writing services uh basically i want to raise your awareness of how they operate and target students in particular now, um, at uh, Oxford Brooks, this is our regulation on custom writing services. The bold bits or all the bits we've had to change really even in the last couple of years because uh, these services constantly evolve and we're kind of rushing to keep up really um, because a, a recent thing um, is uh, we, we've brought in that it is a breach if students request from these sites even if they don't use it, but also if students share or produce work themselves. So that is something else that is really growing. Students sharing their work via these custom writing services or other services and even producing work themselves for these sites. Um, when the pandemic started, uh, we suddenly got all these companies offering 24-7 um, instant exam help. So we've responded to that with this bit, the use of online exam assistance uh, for cheating in assessment is covered by this breach. Um, and really any request, whether it is formative or summative, um, is a breach and using it for anything, even notes or presentations, any kind of work um, is a breach. So I'm just showing you that because um custom writing services have grown and evolved so much um, in recent years uh, we have um i mean uh what's on this slide is just a few examples uh i believe even years ago they were about 800 operating just in the uk the biggest company in the uk is uk essays which is based outside nottingham trent university um uh, there's uh, there's probably an islandessays.com, I would imagine, and uh, many others. We have trouble with ivory research in Oxford. So uh, we have um, uh, people uh, handing out leaflets and cards directly to students coming onto campus um, or getting other students to do that. And uh, translating that into different languages. So, you know, they they really uh, promote themselves a lot. Uh, the artificial intelligence sites here, obviously ChatGPT is the one that's had so much recent attention, but um, these sites have been using AI for a long time. And in fact, the AI um, in say essay bot, that's been around for some time. Uh, already. Uh, a new big danger, though, I do think is the file sharing sites. So sites like Chegg, ThinkSwap, 
course hero that encourage students to sell their work um, and uh, share it is is a really uh, has really become a big business. Oh, that's nice. Thank you for sharing that about the student champions. Great. Um, OK, so what I want to really raise your awareness of is how these companies target students. So I've talked about them coming onto campus, but most of their communications and promotions are digital. So um, here's an example of an email sent to masses of Oxford Brook students. This company called uh, the document co.com they really don't stop with their promotions and I wonder if you if it's big enough on your screen if you can um, comment on why you think it may be sent on a Saturday why it's called student support services and why the key headline is need assignment and dissertation help um, anyone like to comment on these things because they're all part of how these these sites um, operate. Would anyone like to comment on the things I've highlighted here about when it is sent, the subject heading and the, the key? Um, yes, good point, Margaret. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Student support services. Well done, Anne. That's exactly the thing. It sounds as if it is an official communication from the university. If they don't look at the sender, and I'm sure that's a made up uh, point uh, uh, name, um, then they may consider this is uh, official university communication. I've asked no end of uh, people uh, about this um, subject heading. All students say, of course, we'd open it. It sounds as if something is official and, and we would um, want to know about it. And also, I mean, I would hope that when students start to see this image, they might think, oh, hold on, that isn't from my institution. But some students will still be persuaded that need assignment and dissertation help, that word help, which they always use, they might think, OK, this is for help. It's not cheating. It's for help. There's nowhere here that suggests that this is wrong. We hope that the student would think, hold on, 50 pounds for a thousand words. Why are they asking for money? I've paid my fees. Um, uh, that may hopefully ring alarm bells, but not for all students. Some students will think this is maybe a service that's going through the university or um, is, is actually legitimate because it's help. It's not cheating, it's help. They always call what they do help. And so unfortunately, uh, that does uh, confuse students. And I'll just explain a couple of other things. Yeah, they always send these things at weekends because they know that students are working on assignments, maybe with a Monday deadline, but also they're off campus. They're not able to ask someone else, is this a real email? Um, university staff aren't working, so they're not checking. So there's so many reasons that they do that. And then the other thing that hopefully you noticed is that they put all the text in an image. So the university firewall can't read it it will get through. So, you know, these are all typical strategies that these companies are using. They also infiltrate WhatsApp groups. Now, if you think, how on earth do they do that? They find their ways. They maybe go through uh, a student. They pretend to be a student. They um, you know, might pay a student to get access, but they get into student WhatsApp groups. And this is an example. So um, they they start trying to build a, a connection with a student, um, saying hello and things, and then they start to offer them cheating services. So um, you know it's remarkable to me how quickly they immediately respond, even seven a.m. in the morning. Um, they're they're trying to uh, get students to use their services. So 
I think it's really important to tell students that if they set up WhatsApp groups, that this may happen and they need to kick these people out or report them, etc. And of course, these companies are really active on social media. So this is on um, Instagram. Uh, this company ThinkSwap have put this promotion. Oxford Brookes University students and alumni have priority access to sell their notes and past essays on England's new e-learning platform. And that uh, particular description of, this, of their cheating site as England's new e-learning platform really makes me want to vomit. Uh, it is so vile that they're calling their cheating site um, where they're actually making money from students and getting students to cheat an e-learning platform. Um, it's really terrible. But this is has taken off massively. File sharing has become a huge business. So these sites have got a link for every university um, with programmes, with modules, showing students what's available that has been shared by previous students. Um, I think the students who do this think, well, it's OK, I've already submitted this work, so it doesn't matter. Um, but of course, what can happen is then uh, there's a match to previous work. And of course, once they've submitted work to one of these sites, it no longer belongs to them. It could be shared with anyone. And uh, so they've lost their authorship and uh, there are likely to be consequences for them with uh, perhaps their degrees, their results, um, you know, all, all kinds of issues. Um, and yet, um, you know, it's promoted as an e-learning platform. So that's another danger to warn students about. Um, I think often they just really don't realise the consequences of sharing their work. Um, now, related to contract cheating, um, I've uh, worked quite a lot on um, detecting contract cheating in student work. The main thing I would look out for is uh, the references. So unusual references, references that are in a different format, misrepresented, so they're not, the information is not actually from that source, it's about something else, and falsified or untraceable citations is definitely a huge red flag. That is one of the biggest things that can indicate uh, use of custom writing services. It now can also indicate um, use of AI tools. We know that ChatGPT does falsify a lot of sources, not all of them. Usually the most famous ones it uh, provides accurate references for. But what I've been finding is that quite often it uses a real author, a real journal, but a, a falsified article title. Um, I would recommend being suspicious of unusual Turnitin reports that have minimal text matches. So um, maybe we used to think that higher uh, Turnitin matches um, indicated problems. I would say we've shifted our focus to to look at the ones with very low matches because um, these services always offer um, low, like uh, zero plagiarism, they call it, which means they're trying to give students a zero percentage um, on Turnitin. Also, sometimes very general interpretation of source information uh, may be a red flag. Now, I do want to say, apart from this one, which, as I said, is a big red flag, the falsified and or untraceable cite citations, these aren't necessarily indicators on their own of contract cheating, but they are possible red flags. So they are things that I would think about, particularly if there's a lot of them together. So if the references are unusual, different format and misrepresented, and falsified, then I start thinking, OK, this is rather uh, suspicious. 
Um, and also I would look at red flags in the document properties to some extent. Of course, now we can't necessarily uh, verify uh, document properties. Um, you know, there may be many reasons why the editing time is very short or there's a different author. Um, but those are some of the things that we might look at uh, regarding the document properties or the text analysis. So looking at, um, you know, whether the text is too vague or general or unnatural. So um, maybe we can have a brief reflection about contract cheating. Um, what do you think can be done by institutions, staff and students? I know that in Ireland, like in England, the contract cheating services are banned, but they find another way to remarket themselves. They call themselves study skills sites or um, I don't know, uh, some sort of writing help sites rather than um, what they really are. So they, they sort of um, promote themselves a bit differently, but they have not stopped operating. Um, OK. Very advanced interpretation, Eileen. Yeah, so sometimes that can be uh, a, a, a red flag if it is beyond what you would expect. Although most of the contract cheating writers, they're not specialists in the discipline. They um, probably write essays about um, quite a range of uh, disciplines. But yeah, they may be capable of uh, showing more than what you'd expect of a student at that level. Yeah, so would anybody like to comment on this? Yeah, OK, yes, I see that point as well, Eileen. Yeah. Uh, please do come in. Yeah, go ahead, Eileen. Yeah, just on on trying to um, on your question there and what you think can be done. I suppose one thing I OK, awareness is important, but I do think it's important if it is found, it, you know, if it is determined that we do actually bring it through our disciplinary procedures properly you know so that students yeah. can see it is actually being you know punished or you know there is a uh you know if you if you do this it can be found and there yes. are consequences to that yeah yes very important i agree so um we want to make sure that that message does get out that they do realize the consequences of using uh, a service that, you know, they do risk their degree, they risk, um, you know, uh, at, at least failing um, a stage of their course. Um, but I think I would also highlight to students the, the risks to themselves of using these services. They don't have any scruples and there've been a lot of cases where uh, they blackmail or threaten students, even identity theft, asking for more money. Otherwise, they will tell the institution or continuing to threaten them for a long time after uh, using a service. OK, yes, Fiona. Um, AI being undetectable, mm. uh, perhaps we will move on to we're going to talk about AI. I mentioned that that would be the last thing because I knew once we start going down talking about uh, artificial intelligence, I can predict that, um, you know, people will have quite a lot to say because currently it's it's the hottest topic and, um, you know, we're kind of bombarded with considerations about AI. Um, I mean, undetectable. So there are certain things that I would say are um, similar to contract cheating. Of course, the contract cheating writers have been using AI to produce work. So there's a there's a sort of obvious parallel there. But I would say the point about references is really key. So when, um, at least currently, when uh, students do their own research, their references 
should be um, traceable. So probably for um, many assignments, they're using ones that are uh, they've accessed via the library or by some other means that um, has been recommended by the institution. Um, but if they use a contract cheating service, they're likely to have some strange references that can't be accessed from their institution. And likewise, as I said before, the um, chat GPT generates references, some of which are real, but many of which are partly falsified. I've been finding that the titles are not real. They're, they're always some very general title that would never work as an article title. So they say something like international students, uh, colon, a critical review. Well, I don't think anyone would write a um, an article title uh, like that, you know, uh, or uh, higher education, um, a comparison, <laughs> you know, something like uh, uh, th that kind of thing that is way too general. Um, so those are uh, red flags uh, to me. But yeah, the issue is that um, currently there's no verified uh, detection of um, AI tools. Um, lots of people are working on it, but it is proving uh, difficult. So let's have a look at artificial intelligence. I would suggest a good approach is caution, transparency and experimentation. So for your amusement, here is a limerick. Maybe I thought that would be particularly uh, appealing to you. Um, a, a, a limerick written by ChatGPT. I asked it to produce um, uh, uh, how ChatGPT and academic integrity uh, or ChatGPT's approach to academic integrity in the style of a limerick. And that's what it came up with. So pretty ironic, I think, because I don't see that ChatGPT ever has integrity as a top priority. Um, it doesn't feature. So integrity is not there. It's not it's not a priority at all in its output. But it seems to be helping students to write their essays with glee. I have to agree with that bit. OK, uh, so um, at my institution, I've been working a lot on recommendations regarding AI tools. Um, I think you know, so these are recommendations for staff. Um, it's a really good approach to try and use um, ChatGPT yourself <coughs> to upload your ins assignment instructions and see what happens. Um, and then try some different tests. So include different levels of detail. You know, um, start out with just maybe, I don't know, write an essay about X and then bring in some uh, other instructions like in six paragraphs using 10 sources um, and from the perspective of X. Um, and then try and compare the results when you bring in different uh, instructions. And then it's really good to look at what can ChatGP do, do well. So what it can definitely do well is create a plausible text. It can definitely structure logically. It's a master of logical instruction. It can write paragraphs. Um, it will write every paragraph of an identical length. It's extraordinary. And it will always use grammatically correct language. Now, I've tried to test that to see if it would bring in any grammatical errors if I asked it to write from the perspective of a um, a non-native speaker of English, um, someone with, let's say, IELTS 5.5, if you're familiar with that, and it could not make errors. So it doesn't make errors in grammar. Um, so those are the things that it will definitely do very, very well. But that, um, what I found 
sure if I've mentioned it there, no, but it has a kind of artificial balance. So it will always talk about the advantages and disadvantages and the uh, benefits and drawbacks exactly the same. So it has a real difficulty as it's not a sentient being in ha really showing opinions, uh, really having some sort of position on an issue. So what it cannot do well related to that is criticality. It can definitely not do that well. Um, it's not good at critical or accurate and appropriate use of sources. I found a lot of um, uh, misrepresentation or very, very general comments on um, sources. Um, and it's not good at demonstrating relationships between concepts as well. It doesn't seem really capable of um, seeing how, say, one thing meshes or fits or is very different to another. It's not good at that, um, again, because of a, a lack of, of thought and opinion. And what it definitely cannot do is personalise or uh, use class or module examples or use or assess images, though images can be used with GPT-4. I don't know if you've looked at that. I haven't because it has a paywall, but um, I know some people are using that already. Um, now, if you try and test that, so uh, if you say in your prompt, use personal examples or use examples from class, it will respond, um, I am an AI tool, so I can't attend classes, just to remind you. Um, but uh, those are definitely things it cannot do. And therefore, I think as, um, OK, yes, I haven't used the Edge browser. <laughs> Thanks for that, Dee. Um, it, uh, it cannot do these things. So I feel we could capitalise on the things it can't do if we want students not to use AI tools, um, if we want to try and uh, ensure that um, we have a bit of future proofing of our assessment, make sure it's fit for purpose, then I think bringing in more actual class examples um, will help. So uh, my institution, uh, what we're going for is for students, we want transparency, so we haven't in any way attempted to ban um, ChatGPT. Students can use it, but they must declare their use and explain how they used it. Um, I should say that's for not just ChatGPT, it's other AI tools as well, because especially in different uh, fields, say in creative fields, they are using different AI tools, um, but students must declare it and explain how they used it. That's what we're doing at the moment. But we are saying to students, be cautious. So uh, approach it with caution and always credit your sources. And then uh, for staff, our advice is explore the impact on assessment. Try it out as a productivity tool. Uh, sometimes staff are, are very uh, against chat GPT and then they try it out and find, oh, actually, I could create my slides or um, get some new teaching ideas or uh, get it to summarize something. And then suddenly, you know, actually, uh, you might feel differently about it. Um, but we do clarify to students if it cannot be used. So we do um, have the option for some module leaders if they uh, decide, no, for this assessment, it is essential that um, AI tools are avoided, then um, that that is uh, an option. Um, now, in terms of our sector guidance, uh, Brooks is really following that uh, very closely. So this is guidance from QAA um, that uh, the important thing to do is communicate with students, engage early. So um, really good to get uh, messages out to students, not to kind of uh, uh, leave them wondering what to do. Um, yeah, thanks for that, uh, Jacqueline. Yeah, 
I know constantly uh, we are rushing to keep up with all the developments in AI. There's more and more. We know it's going to be incorporated um, in Google, in Microsoft. So there is there's so much uh, development. Um, it's really accelerated. Um, so back to the sector guidance. Um, student declaration, I think it's really important to actually uh, it's part of the communication, keeping up with what students are doing. And then developing policies and practices, I have to say at present we have guidance rather than a policy, but based on our monitoring of what students are declaring, we are working on uh, a policy. We're also um, doing a full consultation with students and staff um, on our approach to um, AI tools in order to feed that into the policy as well. Um, and then assessment design. So obviously it's really important to look at assessment design currently. Is it fit for purpose? Is it um, appropriate uh, now in the current situation? Um, you know, I think uh, we're looking, as I said before, at more personalizing and uh, in-class type examples. Also, perhaps more performance based assessment, more something that could be done in class or could be part of a dialogue uh, with a student if we really want to test their knowledge. And uh, yeah, um, be cautious in detection tools, as mentioned uh, previously. Um, you know, uh, everyone is concerned about detection tools. Some people have said this is a greater danger than um, the AI tools themselves because it could lead to um, inappropriate uh, suspicions. OK, so we're reaching the end. I'm happy to talk more about AI tools, but I wonder about your key takeaways as well. Uh, there's a few questions there. Um, you may want to consider your approaches to AI tools at present, um, but I'm happy to continue conversations uh, now and you're welcome to email me if you have uh, further points you want to raise. So uh, can I ask if anyone would like to talk about any of those issues, including um, AI tools, any comments, anything else you would like to um, add to that. Please do feel free to unmute. Hi, Mary, it's Rose from AT Sligo. Hi, hi, thank you very much. It's very engaging and oh, um, I'm loving all the detail about AI because I went to a great workshop the last one about AI in learning. But the question I want to ask you just really briefly is, like with um, your university, how did you actually um, make sort of decisions around like academic integrity and, and how more specifically like their like uses of AI? Did you actually have, for example, like a way days for the whole staff to make sure that the whole department is talking about it and bringing students into those meetings? Or what were the actual logistics of ensuring that everyone is actually um, looking at AI in a way that's multi-perspectival, but also has a cohesion as a department? How did you achieve that? Hmm. Um Rose, I'm not going to claim that we've had a completely ideal response to AI. I think like many institutions, uh, it has been challenging um, because things happened very, very quickly. Um, and in January, we, we sort of returned with uh, a need for immediate responses. Um, but uh, I'm the academic integrity lead, so I could take a key role in this, along with our Pro Vice Chancellor for Education. And so we work together on uh, all school or all institution, I should say, communications, um, first of all. Um, 
we used the QAA guidance, so we're using the sector guidance as a starting point and then sort of assembled representatives from around the institution um, with. Uh, so we had some discussions and uh, feedback on our sort of initial responses, but then so at that point, I suppose we were communicating with everyone but we weren't get, getting everyone to feed in. But um, gradually, so over the past few months, we've run a lot of different um, staff workshops um, to try to involve as many people as possible, um, looking at different things. So um, we've had some that have focused more on general use of technology. We've had others focusing more on assessment and updating assessment design. Um, and now we're in a consultation phase because our aim is to produce a policy for September. So we've been giving guidance rather than an actual policy. We've tried to cover any practices with our initial um, or our existing, I should say, uh, policies, and then we are working on a policy. But, you know, I think like most institutions, we've been rushing around trying to sort out things very urgently, um, having a, a, a lot of meetings uh, and also a lot of uh, networking with other institutions. I belong to several um, networks, so I've benefited from uh, the guidance there and of course attending lots of events as you said I don't know if you were at the University of Kent we're running one yesterday on uh, student voice in AI which was really enlightening so yeah a huge number of uh, events to get more insights so I hope that answers your question. No, that's 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 brilliant. Yeah, very comprehensive. Um, just really briefly, um, is there somewhere that I mean, what what are you accessing in terms of looking at your national discussion? Like you're saying, there was a conference in Kent yesterday, but I mean, is there sort of um, are there sorts of groups now emerging, like just specifically around AI issues that actually have a collaborative, um, say, site or you know, like talking about what the national response is. I would look at the QAA, QAA website QAA, if you want yeah. to find out about um, uh, what's going on in the UK in terms of AI, because there's lots of um, further connections there. So they've given yeah. sector guidance and they link up to different initiatives. But University of Kent is very active. I think it's called the uh, the, the learning, is it the learning technologists and AI or? Yeah. And I was going to say, I know you've got the um, uh, the Irish Academic uh, yeah. Integrity Network and yeah. it's QQI in in Ireland, yeah. isn't it? That yeah. That's the equivalent of QAA in the UK. So I'm sure they will have a lot of connections and resources as well. Yeah, no, I was just, yeah, I was just, re I was curious about your sources. Yeah, I'm aware of the ones in Ireland. Okay. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, so thank okay. you very much, Mary. No, you're, you're welcome, Rose. Thanks for your comments. Um, anybody else like to come in? Thanks for sharing the link, Deirdre, that's great. Anybody else like to comment on AI or anything else? I'll keep these questions up for a moment. Sorry, dear to hear. Yes. Um, yeah, just I suppose um, teaching online, I just find the whole AI side of things when you're teaching in an online environment and everything is given to them in a text based format. It's, you know, all of your ideas for a classroom based environment, you know, help. But it is so amazing. Um, I think I still haven't worked out <laughs> how you deal with it. Um, well, but I do think uh, there's additional teaching, difficulties. Yeah. Yes, Dee. So what you're saying is the the challenge of of um, teaching online and trying to teach academic integrity. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Um, you know, creating assessments that uh, will genuinely 
and get them to learn the stuff and not just get very good at chat GPT. Um, you know, uh, I, I still yeah. haven't got my head around it. I, I teach it. I teach it to them because I'm doing content marketing and they have to know about it. Um, yes. But Pandora's box okay. is open and it will stay open. So uh, just <sighs> trying to get my head around it. OK, well, I'll, I'll share one activity that I think is uh, a really um, useful way to use uh, ChatGPT with your students if you if you want to. And that's um, to get them to generate a text or you could generate a text together um, and then to do some fact checking. Like, you know, is it actually accurate, the assertions in this in this text? And also, can you find good academic sources for these points because it's very unlikely that chat gpt will have found good academic real authentic sources for these points so that's a way to generate something that then can create um you know legitimate and useful work i think yeah yeah you know i i mean it is it is fantastic i mean it, it is wonderful as well as you know slightly daunting um but I think, you know, even if they don't use it to write the thing, they'll often use it to structure it. And yes. that ability to be able to mentally structure. Yes. I think it's going to be very hard to not have them doing that. And I think that's a fundamental skill. It is. Yes. Um, I mean, uh, we, we have to just keep thinking of ways that we can uh, facilitate students learning these skills. Um, you know, it could be that um, you you have a specific focus on structure. Uh, you get students to talk through their structure before they write it, so that you know it's not just being uh, not just relying on Chat GPT. It could be. I'm I'm looking at that at the moment actually to to see how we can build in sort of the, the authenticity checks in the process of creating uh, a text. So uh, maybe more conversations with students where possible or more additional records. Um, but I actually feel overall the most important thing to be doing is is encouraging students to engage in their learning. I mean, if we oh, can absolutely. do that, yeah, yeah, then, you know, Whatever else they're doing, uh, I mean, they're likely to make better decisions. They're likely to actually want to learn the things, so they're not going to um, just, you know, get a text generated if we yeah. really engage them. So I think focusing back on the culture for learning um, is really essential. Yeah. I think we have a bumpy road ahead, though. Oh, oh yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to deny that. So uh, I'm aware of the time and now Deirdre has appeared. So I think we probably need to finish there, Deirdre. <laughs> yes, um, thank you so much.